word to many people. Acres USA says it uh, this way. It says, now Acres USA, this is where you want to learn regenerative agriculture. Acres USA. It's so the voice for ecological agriculture. I began to read this magazine two years after it was first published, and that was 52 years ago. And it's been a, a wonderful resource. Now it's teaching the regenerative agriculture, but this is what it says. We spend a lot of time in the regenerative agriculture community debating what regenerative means. So we're going to take a look at it. Now, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Those are the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. Now, he created a paradise on earth. No sickness or disease existed in plants, plants that fed us and animals. So, of course, there was no sickness and disease in us or animals. There was no sickness, disease in the plants or animals or us. There was no competition for limited resources. There was food for all, habitat for all, and healthy mates for all. This is the design that began this planet where we're living on. There was no mistakes needing correction. No need for genetic modification. No need for hybrids. No mutations. All was open pollinated perfection. All the plants were just open pollinated, either insects or air or whatever. And it was perfect. No sickness and disease in any of it. Now, the Bible tells us in Genesis 2 5, mankind was given the job to work the ground. And then, a couple of verses on, it says, Genesis 2 8 and 9, it said, God gave mankind a garden homestead that he designed for our first parents. And we were to duplicate that design and fill the earth with it. Everyone was supposed to have a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. And in Genesis 2.15, a little further, it says they were to reserve the plants in the garden that God designed and keep up the garden God's way. So why do we have a mess today? We didn't do it at all. We didn't keep it the way. We didn't keep the ground the way he said. Regenerative agriculture is learning how to keep the ground the way he said initially when it was a paradise. It's called getting back to it. It's regenerating what we have degenerated. Now, today, there are several ways agriculture is carried out. Slash and burn and then plant. That's the primitive way. If you're not familiar with this, I was down in southern Mexico. And when we came into the mission stations, there was just smoke everywhere. They were had slashed a while before, and now it was dry, and they were just burning it off. And so when I walked through the area and saw some of the peanuts that were planted, I looked in the leaves, and there's potassium deficiency. The potassium was in the, the vegetation, or you wouldn't have grown the trees and things that were there, but it all went up in smoke. And there wasn't organic matter to hold the minerals, so they washed out. Not a good way to grow. Now, modern agriculture, we burn the plants off, and it's called burn down. Farmers call it burn down with herbicides. We use Roundup and burn it down. And then they fertilize it with chemicals, and then they plant it, and then they spray with chemicals the pests and the diseases, the fungal diseases and the bacteria and uh, viruses with fungicides and bactericides and viricides and insecticides and to try to hold back God's garbage disposal crews from eating the garbage. He designed them to clean up the mess if we ruined it. So regenerative agriculture, uh, then, then, then the, uh, the Second way of burning, I mean, excuse me, of uh, growing is the organic way. And in this way, you till with light or heavy machinery, you fertilize with natural fertilizers, and then you spray to kill the pest with natural poisons. Okay, that's the organic method. Regenerative agriculture is where you keep the ground covered with growing plants. We got planted the whole planet, it was covered. He didn't uncover it. You keep it covered with growing plants that assist the crop you're growing 
and we'll be talking about it, by feeding the soil microbiome. Now, a microbiome is the microscopic creatures that you can't see that live in the soil, and there are from anywhere to 50 to 100,000 different species, according to how we measure species. And they feed the microbiome, and that fertilizes the crop. And, it, and that fertilization that the microbes give imparts disease and pest resistance. We're going to see how this all operates. This is giving you an overview. Regenerative agriculture is, is the ecosystem design that God gave mankind in Genesis 2, 8, 9, when he gave him this garden home. We were to keep it the way he designed it. That's what it says in Genesis 2, 15. And we were to work the ground God's way. And we're going to be seeing about that. That was what Genesis 2, 5 said. So we can see this regenerative agriculture is actually a getting back to the biblical way God designed things. Now, agricultural land worldwide are damaged. Uh, working the ground our way has resulted in compaction, which is the biggest problem in agriculture worldwide. A serious loss of organic matter. Yeah. We'll be seeing there are these effects here as we continue. Minerals tied up so that the plants can't get them and use them. We have soil life that has been killed off by the fertilizers that have been being used. And we have dead zones in the bays and estuaries and gulfs and seas from runoff of the fertilizers. And there are like over 400 of them. And the largest one is in the Gulf of Mexico at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Now, genetically, the damage has been, plants have been genetically modified to be soaked in Roundup poison and still live. Genetic, genetic modification of corn and other things to grow their own insect poison. And then we eat it. You buy corn in the cob at the store? It's BT corn. It grew its own poison to kill the insects. And you get to eat it, but you're big enough that it doesn't kill you. Only starts to develop problems. In you. And then we no longer feed the microbes that God designed to feed them. When you put on chemical fertilizers, the plant immediately says, well, "I sure don't need nitrogen, NPK, nitrogen, phosphate, and that. I sure don't need that. I got plenty of it here." And they stop feeding the microbes that would provide it for them. And when they stop feeding the microbe, then the plant gets how much we put on. Biggest problem we have with sickness and disease in plants today is excesses or deficiency of fertilizers because we're doing the fertilization instead of letting the microbe do it. And we'll get into how the microbe do it, but we're just laying a foundation here. Now, the prefix RE means back again, restore, store back again replace, place back again where they were, replant, plant back again how they were, return, come back again. We need to return to the past where the soil was not degraded. We need to restore the ground's microbiome so it can restore the fertility God made in the beginning. And we need to replant the ecosystem design God gave our first parents in that garden. And we need to replace the garden design that was a paradise. We're going to see how this all operates as we go along. This is regenerative agriculture. Now, regenerative agriculture is redeeming the degraded ground and redeeming the degenerated genetics of the crop. Now, agriculture is Latin for soil culture. And so we have, you can cultivate a field, doesn't necessarily mean till, you can cultivate a vineyard, we don't really till vineyards, you can cultivate an orchard, cultivate a grove, these last three are permacultures, permanent cultures, fields we're going to see in regenerative agriculture are permanently cultured, they are becoming permacultures. We'll see as we go along. 
Now, regenerative agriculture is a return to the cultivation of crops by planting biodiversity. These are all new terms, but they're terms we sort of have to learn, especially since farmers are being removed from the land because of the way they farm. Holland is taking the land away from the farmers, and Holland feeds most of Europe. Now, biodiversity means growing several different plants together, like we see in that chestnut oak ridge up there, like we see in the red maple swamp behind my house there, and like we see in this cattail marsh. You go through it, you'll find maybe 20 to 30 species that make up that ecosystem. Now, an ecosystem is a community of plants that are beneficial companions to each other. We've heard of companion planting. These are beneficial companions to one another. Uh, that black walnut there has specific companions. And if you look at the plants near the bottom, you'll see they're sick. They are not the companions for the walnut. Walnuts exude certain chemicals. And I'm going to be putting blackberries here because that's a companion to a walnut. Okay, so we have to learn companion planting. What is a companion to others? Now, companion planting is like basil with tomatoes. Everybody knows basil and tomatoes go together or, or beans and corn. And, and the Native Americans, they had three companions. They called the three sisters. And they would plant a clump of corn, many clumps of corn. And then they would plant beans that would use the corn as a stalk. And then they would plant amongst these clumps of corn, squash or pumpkin. Now, the beans would take, they support bacteria that produce excessive amounts of nitrogen, and that would help feed the corn. They'd use the stalk to climb it. The pumpkins and squ or squash would shade the ground and conserve the moisture for the other two. And the spines on them, we've bred spines out of them because we don't like spines. I mean, I, I don't particularly like them either when I go picking, but sometimes they stick here and you can and, and the raccoons wouldn't like to go in there and get the corn. And we know how big a problem raccoons are around here. They get the corn. Last year, they just wiped us out. So this is what they did. This is this was a the three sisters, the Native American Jew. Um, uh, I don't see Margie. Hi, Margie. Um, she was telling me she's from Central America. And uh, she was taught by a grandfather, put four black bean seeds around each corn stalk. Let, the, let them climb up and it feeds them. This is, we're going back to the past. Regenerative agriculture is going back to the past. The natives of this world, they knew how to work with it. We have taught the world how to trash it big time, big time. Okay, now, the Three Sisters is a biodiverse, different plants, of three companion plants, creating an ecosystem where each plant serves the other. No competition. You've heard in evolution that everything is competing, not in the design out there. You can find everywhere ecosystems on Earth where the species in that ecosystem are all beneficial to one another. The concept of evolution developed easily when we trashed things because things were a mess and so we had sick things and so there was competition for mates competition for food competition for habitat but not in the regenerative design this is why we want to get back to it now plant biodiversity takes many forms in many different environments uh, in the wet tropics you would dig a hole throw the soil out around you, as far as you can heave it, and you would end up with a depression that would fill with water, and in that you would plant your uh, taro, as I would call it, because I lived in Hawaii, 
Uh, but in Jamaica, it would be uh, it would be um, Dasheen or Coco. In the other islands, it would be Idos. And, and if you're Spanish, it would be Altia. Okay, so in the wet, you would plant those things that like to grow in the water. On the edge of the water, you would plant the things that like to grow on the edge of the water. On the mound that you made around it, you would plant plantain or bananas, a staple carbohydrate, facing in one direction so that they would keep marching around the circle as the rhizome moves forward. And underneath that, you would plant sweet potatoes. And then around the circle, you would plant coconuts because there's too much sunlight in the tropics. We're going to be looking at light. Too much sunlight in the tropics, and you need to filter filter it and reduce the amount of sunlight, or it stops photosynthesis, and you don't have the production of sugar, which makes the food that feeds us, and the proteins that build our body. Now, in the temperate zone, we mentioned the black beans. We mentioned the the uh, Native American three sisters. Uh, you can plant your asparagus in a, in a white clover patch or red clover even because it's asparagus and tall and you could plant like two rows of corn two rows of soybeans um and you could add grow in and we'll we'll be taking a look at some of these in the garden design you would have a bean or a legume or a pea and then something that feeds off of it growing alongside of it um We'll look more into this. Then, then in your dry regions like Senegal, uh, it's, it's on the edge of the Sahara. The millet farmers have learned to increase production 900%. That means if you're making nine, uh, 10 pounds of millet, you can increase the millet production to 90 pounds by planting 1,500 of these shrubs throughout, scattered throughout evenly dispersed throughout that hectare, and then you plant your millet amongst that. This shrub would go down 20 to 30 feet, draw up the water, and then that water, would tr it would transpire as it needed it all day long, but at night when it didn't need it, it exudes it out into the soil, and it fed the millet, and increased production ninefold. And then the farmer, all he does, his job is just to walk around with his machete, just uh, cut off the tips of the shrubs to keep them a certain size so they don't shade the millet. And they, this falls down in the ground, this chop and drop system falls on the ground and feeds the plants. So there are different systems for different ecosystems. For different climates, you would do different things. Now, the more plants you grow together, the higher the yield is. The more plants you grow together, the higher the yield is. Now, in German studies, they've increased two plants, three different plants together, four or five. They've got up to eight plants, and each time they increase production on that acre by adding different plants in the mix. Now, that's going to take machinery that can separate oat seeds from pea seeds and things like that, but it's, it's successful. And it, so... These ecosystems that are natural, that were originally designed by God, they have 20 to 30 in the temperate zone here. The tropics, you can have up to 4,000 in a square mile. I mean, it gets, it's mind-boggling uh, what they can do. But 20 to 30 in the temperate zone around here, like in the, that red maple swamp or, the, or that uh, chestnut oak ridge or the cattail marsh and these are all beneficial they're all serving one another so we're going to be looking at some of this now in india bandana shiva says that they have traditional plantings of five sevens and twelves and the uh these are the basic principles now i don't know what this ecosystem is that god gave mankind in genesis 2 8 and 9 but it was to maintain a planet perfectly producing enormous production Amen such that there was never a need for food, never a need for, for habitat, and, and never a problem with healthy mates, because all the food was healthy. And so they have, traditionally in India, plantings of five, sevens, and twelves. Now, a friend of mine is a missionary and has a mission station in India and right over the border in Nepal, and she was taught this by someone in India. And I tried to look it up, but I can't speak Indian, so I don't know what they're saying when they try to 
tell you what's going on. So, but she gave me this, and it was written in English, she sent it to me. They take colors, and they alternate them. Red cabbage, green cabbage, red cabbage, green cabbage. Or red lettuce, green lettuce, you know, alternate colors. You have the plants that produce anthocyanins, your purple, blues, and reds. That's one color. And then you have plants that are basically green, maybe yellow phases to it. That's another color. You interplant those colors. Then you, another thing they do is put in aromatics. Interplant amongst them aromatics. And the aromatics are your onion family, your uh, your alliums, you know, it could be chives or uh, leeks or just on and on. And aromatic herbs, you can interplant them with the plants. Another thing they do is they plant smooth leaf, rough leaf. Smooth leaf, rough leaf. And we're going to see why these variations are put together like this. And you can have, you have your smooth leaf cabbage or lettuce, but you have your rough leaf, the hairs on a radish leaf, uh, the roughness of a, of a cucumber leaf. Um, and then the fourth thing is frilly leaves. I call them frilly leaves. They call, it, call them cut leaves. And basically, as I search them out there, basically the umbellifery family. Uh, I w meant to grab some Queen Anne's lace flowers. Queen Anne's lace here on our farm is actually Daucus carotis, which is carrot. The white European carrot was crossed with Pakistani red by the Dutch. They're quite interesting farmers, good farmers. Three, four hundred years ago, and we get the orange carrot that we have today. So that's an umbellifery. And you can tell by the leaves are very fragrant. Um, so there's, they're, they're imparting volatile vapors into the air. And then the fifth thing is tap roots or surface roots. Now, you're going to notice that we, we have many duplications here. Because if you're going to plant smooth leaves and hairy leaves, you'll end up planting a radish or a mustard, which is a tap root amongst your surface rooted lettuce and cabbage. So the tap roots go down, draw nutrients up, bring them to the surface. The others have their, their work to do. Now, all species of plants, I'm talking our agricultural plant, plants and all our wild plants, all species of plants are specific mineral accumulators. The obvious one, what do the legumes produce? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Okay, that's, that's obvious. We all talk about that. We know that one. They are specific mineral accumulators, and the excess minerals they exude out into the soil around for the other roots to pick up and utilize in their growth. So this is why when you increase biodiversity and have more and more plants, you have a better and better feeding operation. Now, what enables a plant to be an, a mineral accumulator? Not only is it the de genetic design, but it's a, the, the, the genetic design calling for more of specific minerals to be mined by the microbes. Okay, it can get a little complex, but this is how it works. The excesses they accumulate are shared with the plants around them, and all ecosystem, all, uh, ecosystem plants serve each other. They don't compete. They're all doing something that serves one another. The design must be companions. When we make these designs, it must be of companions. We don't want to be planting things in a black walnut influence behind you, that black walnut right there, that can't grow with the exudates that it's exuding into the soil, except, say, a blackberry and other things that grow in a black walnut ecosystem. Now, regenerative agriculture is where we plant the ground with biodiverse ecosystem of companion plants that feed the ground's microbiome, because it's the plants that feed the, the microbes, so that the microbiome can feed the plants with a diet that imparts disease resistance and pest resistance, not only to the plant, but to us and everything that eats it. Now, we're going to take a look at microbes and see how this all operates. 
plants' roots go out, and we have been taught that roots take in nutrition. Well, basically they do. Mycorrhizal fungi, myco meaning fungus, myco, mycology, the study of fungus, mycorrhizal, rhizome meaning root, fungus, they are microscopic, hair-like, they're called mycelium, the roots of the fungus, and they just spread out. So they attach themselves to the root of the plant, and then they spread out in the soil, and they mine rock. Now, this highway system of mining rock and shipping it back on these fungal roots to the plant has internet system. An internet system, this is no joke, an internet system whereby the plants request the specific mineral that they need when they need it. When they're growing vegetatively, they don't need a lot of particular minerals. They need certain other ones. But during reproduction, they could need 50 times more. They just send the signal as to how much they need. Now, these mycorrhizae, these fungal roots, we'll just call them fungal roots, they go out and do the mining. Along the highway system are factories of bacteria. They operate to make plant nutrients. They're called phytonutrients. And these nutrients, as they're called for by the plant, are taken by the fungal roots and carried to the plant as they call from, it, from the bacterial factories. Okay? Now, this highway system is two, two lanes in the same tube. That's pretty good. Flowing both ways in the same tube. Because what's flowing out is that the plant is gathering sunlight and it's converting that sunlight energy into carbohydrate energy, sugar energy. And that is being pumped down into the roots and out into the soil because the fungus aren't photosynthetic. They can't make their own sugars. They have to be fed. So too, the bacteria, they're in the ground. They're not up where there's light. And so you have this system going where the plant is feeding these micro, the microbiome, microscopic fungus, microscopic bacteria, and they're in turn feeding the plant. Now, that's one system that's in operation. Another system that's in operation that's microscopic is called rhizophagy. Now, this is, this is new stuff. Just I learned about some of these things just in the last year in Acres USA. They're showing the science now to show that the original design that God made, although they don't mention God, but it's the one he gave. This is why I started with Genesis, because he tells us right there how he did it. And rhizophagy is where roots, plant roots, go into the soil and they engulf. Rhizo meaning root and phagy meaning phagocytosis. The white blood cells are phagocytic. They engulf things. Well, the roots are phagocytic and they engulf bacteria. Take care of bacteria right into themselves. They secrete, the roots secrete a digestive fluid that digests the outer coating of the bacteria. It releases the nutrients that the bacteria has gathered outside the plant, and then the bacteria reproduces into fours. And then the plant moves them along in the vascular system to the portals of the hair root, where they then exude them out into the soil so that they can go feed again, and if it's a continual process. So they provide, the plant provides an environment for reproduction for the bacteria, and the bacteria provides it food. Now that's rhizophagy. They, they've learned some very interesting things in these studies here. Plants um, engulf these bacteria. They have what they call a fourth phase of water. They call it easy water. And it transports these bacteria, not just out 
into the soil to feed again and be brought back in again. But they will transfer, transport bacteria to different places in the plant, up in the foliage, and in the leaves and flowers and, and stems. And then those bacteria are transported across the cell wall and serve to feed the actual cells, the growing cells of the plant. This is called endocytosis. All of these, you can read this last issue of Baker's USA had a little uh, magazine that came with it here. It's called Healthy Soil Problem Solving. And it shows you where you can go to find the sources of this research that is coming out to show how regenerative agriculture works. Now, another operation is going on is what's called not only the rhizosphere, but the phylosphere. How much time do we have? It's 11.35. 11.35? Okay. Um, the rise, the phylo, phylo meaning leaf, it's the sphere of microorganisms living on the leaf. There's bacteria and fungus and yeast of all sorts. You don't have to worry about B12 when you're eating plants. Because if you eat them out of the garden, you've got yeast on them, and they're, they make all the B vitamins. When I lived in California, this was like 30 some odd years ago, the Walmart, they, well, it wasn't Walmart, it was Kmart, would sell gallon jugs of B vitamins. It's a yeast make. I mean, they're, they're way ahead in, in natural agriculture back then in there. And so you have this phylosphere. Now, the phylosphere is very important. For instance, here in New England, where we have no boron in the subsoil, um, we have boron in the topsoil. How did it get there? The phylosphere. Calcium, phosphate, and potassium cannot usually be gotten in the amount that the plant needs just, just from the air. All the other minerals the plant needs can be taken out of the air. That's how important this system is. Matter of fact, 80% of the nutrition a plant receives is CO2 out of the air. It's a very highly operated system. So we have the boron that we now have in our topsoil here in New England. All has been taken out of the air. And the microbes, when they give it to the plant, the plant immediately sends it to the roots to make sure that the microbes that are feeding it get the boron it needs. You see, the plant makes sure all the nutrients that the microbes need. As a matter of fact, when you have a plant that's not doing well and you foliar feed it with different nutrients, those nutrients go first to the microbes in the soil and second to the plant. It's a beneficial system. Everybody serves everybody. But you serve the microbes in the soil and then they can really serve the plant, the fertilizer that it needs. And so... You have blossom and rot on a tomato. And you go to university, it tells you, well, this is a calcium deficiency in the tomato. But what's really going on is the boron that was needed to transport the calcium, because if you did a soil analysis, you find out there's plenty of calcium there. But you got a calcium deficiency in the tomato. You know, that black spot that's dry on the bottom of the tomato. Okay, that's the blossom and rot. And the reason is because there isn't the boron to transport the calcium. Boron's role is the transporter of calcium. And the reason the boron can't transport it is because the, um, the uh, water, which is starting to go, <laughs> is, uh, is not there in the soil. So when you let the soil get dry, you get a calcium deficiency via no boron being made available to the plant. Um, I hope it doesn't do too much. We'll see. We'll continue here. Uh, another thing uh, is the B vitamins. We talked about them. The uh, keep going, Gary. Okay. So the uh, we've heard of the Blue Ridge Mountains and the smoke Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, the Smoky Mountains in Georgia. What you have is volatile fertilizers, we'll call them fertilizers, nutrients being exuded into the air. And these volatile nutrients are absorbed by the leaf of the plant. So the entire forest is sharing its nutrition in the air, via the air, as well as sharing nutrition in the soil. 
okay? So it's a very important system, the phylosphere. Now, disease resistance. How does the fertilization of microbes impart disease resistance? Very interesting system. Mother plants impart to their seed a microbiome. Mamas impart to their babies a gut microbiome. Okay, and uh, this is how we all have our mi gut microbiome. We get it from our mothers at birth. Well, the mother plant does that to the seed. But when we treat the seed with fungicides on the seed, insecticides on the seed, steam treatment, acid, alkali, we kill off the microbiome on it. And so the seedling begins to grow. It has a tough time because the bacteria and the fungus and the other things that it needed to be assisted with in its growth are missing. And this is what is I thought was quite interesting. When the bacteria that should have been there are not there, let's take a look at it from this angle. When they are there, the bacteria start to proliferate in the soil, start to feed in the soil, and then these bacteria are engulfed by the plant and the mycorrhizal fungi, we talked about them, they go out with these long roots and they mine and they bring in nutrients and stuff like that. And then they go, some of them go right into the root itself. Others just go to the kitchen door. Some go right into the kitchen. These fungus that go into the kitchen and deliver the nutrients in the kitchen, if they have not first fed the bacteria, then what they deliver is probably in excess because they're then called pathogenic fungi. They're, they're delivering nutrition that's making the plant sick. But if the bacteria are there and they feed off at first, when they deliver it, they deliver a balanced source of nutrition and they're beneficial. So we see that when you interfere with a ecosystem, in this case, the microscopic ecosystem, you impart to the plant diseases, sickness and disease by altering the ecosystem. But if you maintain the ecosystem, when it operates, it imparts to the plant disease resistance. Now, also in the soil are glomus species of bacteria. You have a decay system in the soil. And the glomus species, what they do is they take the carbon structure in the decay process and they make very complex apartment complexes for the free living microbes. This is called humus. It's a honeycombed carbon structure, very complex, that are actually made by the glomus species of bacteria. In the prairies, they have topsoil as deep as 20 feet that has been made by the glomus species. And so you have phenomenal production. Uh, the United States is called the breadbasket of the world. I mean, it saved Europe after World War II and many other nations because of our phenomenal production, because of the richness of the soil due to the glomus species of bacteria and, and others that, manu that manufacture humans. Now, biodiversity, we talked about the biodiversity of plants and how all plants are, um, are accumulators of specific minerals and nutrition. They all accumulate and have excesses and these excesses go forward and they feed, they feed the, the plants that grow around them. So the more plants, different plants you have growing in your biodiversity, the more feeding the operation and the higher the production rate is. And so this is why farmers are now seeking to how many they can grow. How many different plants can they develop in their crop ecosystem? Because the more that they can get in there, the higher the production they get per acre because of the biodiversity and the support of many different microbial populations by the different plants you increase productivity in the soil. Now, we have uh, sunlight energy. And, and one other thing I can add here to the uh, bacteria that make the 
microbiome that make uh, the habitat for the free-living microbes is that humus production increases as you go north, and it decreases till there's none as you go south towards the tropics. In the tropics, things are just decomposed and immediately go up into the plant. But the natives of the tropics of the world, they were wise people. They know, and they knew, that when you remove the, the jungle, you char it. And they made char, charcoal, and put it back in the soil. These are microscopic honeycomb carbon structures that serve as homes. Um, when they were cutting down the Amazon to grow sugarcane and soybeans and corn, they found black soils that were made hundreds of years ago by the million or more natives that lived there. And you say, well, where are they today? Do you know that the natives of the Americas had enormous populations in the Amazon. There was a, over a million, I mean, a, a hundred million there. And 30 years later, when the Europeans came back, there was about 5 million left. The Europeans brought diseases. When the pilgrims landed, do you think they had the clear land to plant their corn? No. They planted in a village that just had been abandoned because everyone had died off. And what few were left said, this place is cursed. We're getting out of here. Uh, when Christopher Columbus landed in Hispaniola there, they said they estimated 60,000 to a million and a half. When he came back, 500 left. We brought diseases that didn't kill us, but killed them. So it was clean, but they left behind in Brazil, terra preta, Brazilian for black soil. And I, uh, a friend of mine uh, grew up in, in Papua, New Guinea, and he grew up in a village and farm. He's an MD now, but anyway, he did that, and he used to tell me how they burn and, and scrape it down here, but it's real mountainous in, in, in New Guinea, and scrape the fires down so, so the charcoal would fall behind in the soil. They knew and understood the importance of charring the vegetation. Now, um, sunlight. You can't grow things without sunlight, right? Okay, and so we all understand that. The plants repackage sunlight energy in a form we can use, sugars. And then we take those sugars and add a little nitrogen to it, or I should say take the sugars and add a little nitrogen to it and make the proteins that we all need to build our structures. So sunlight is very important. The photosynthetic process is very important. And so in our agricultural practices, especially tilling, we have highly oxygenated the soil. Highly oxygenated the soil by our tilling practices. You till it up and you know the oxygen gets in better, right? When we do this, we convert the forms of minerals into forms that can't be used by the plant. An important one is manganese. Manganese, you cannot have a seed without a lodestone of manganese. Also, manganese is necessary for photosynthesis, but it has to be in a reduced oxygen form. You've all heard of pH? Okay, this is called EH, and it's more important than pH. EH is an oxidative reduction. Now, I studied this in chemistry in high school. I didn't know what they're talking about. I never could understand chemistry. It just, I don't know why. I don't think I have good teachers because I learned recently how simple it is. Manganese, people put it on the form of manganese sulfate. It's the most common form. Oh, you need manganese in your soil. Put some manganese sulfate on. But the thing is, manganese sulfate, the manganese sulfate can't be used for the plant. They have to convert it. This is, the, this is what oxidation reduction is. MN for manganese, SO4, manganese sul, S sulfur, sulfate, O4. Well, the plants can't use it with the O4, four oxygen. They can use it in a two oxygen form, manganese oxide, MnO2. So you got to have these microbes that reduce it to the two oxygen form. 
and then you can increase photosynthesis. The more photosynthesis you have, the more energy production, the more protein production, and the higher yields of quality food you're going to get. Now, there are crops that we can plant, and I've been planting them, and others have planted them, many of the farmers plant them, and these cover crops are legumes, brassicas, oats, buckwheat, and corn, not GMO corn. And with these cover crops that they use, they convert the manganese into a form that's usable. Okay? Now, this pretty much nears the conclusion of what I was going to introduce to you this morning about the microbiome and how it works, and all the microbes and how they work. Uh, but I just want to finish what is our role. Our role is to serve the ground, as it says in Genesis 2 fly, and to serve the garden that by, by making this biodiversity design and then keeping it that way. And then in Proverbs 4.12, it tells us, there is a way to seem right unto a man, but the end of, of are the ways of death. So we have sickness, disease, because we're doing it our own way. Uh, Proverbs 28.19 says, he that tilleth his land, and that word tilleth means serves it, the way God designed it, shall have plenty of bread. But then it also warns us in Genesis 4.12, Cain, when you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you with strength. Not only that, you're going to be going to choose the tooth in a bag of bones. You're going to have to clap your burn instead of taking care of the microbes. And then you have to abandon the land and leave and go somewhere else and start all over again. So, to sum it all up, the design that God gave us in the beginning, which we've even lost sight of, not just lost sight of, we don't even know hardly how the design operates, except there's some very wise people out there, wise farmers like in India, that know five and seven and twelve. We have to learn these like the three sisters, the Native Americans. They understood that design was important. We have to relearn these designs. And then we can have plants that impart freedom from sickness and disease to those that eat them. They'll feed the microbes so that they'll be free from sickness and disease. They'll feed us and they'll feed the animals so we're all free from sickness and disease. But we have to operate this system which is called regenerative agriculture according to the design. That concludes my talk. Thank mm -hmm. you.